Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. This is Graham. Thank you so much for watching today. And today I'm going to be telling you guys about my au pair horror story part two. So before I even talk about this video, please hit that like and subscribe button so I can keep making content just like this. Your support really goes a long way. So today I'm going to be giving you guys the second part of my au pair horror story, what I did after I was kicked out, and then be sure to watch to the end to hear my big three takeaways, three priceless takeaways to help you avoid this kind of situation. I wish I would have heard these before I got myself into the situation. So please, if you do nothing else, please look at the three takeaways at the end. It's super important. I wanted to make this video as a follow-up to my first au pair horror story. If you haven't watched that, I'll put the link right here, but it's super important. And essentially it just talks about what happened to me, what went wrong. And to understand this video, you'll probably need to look at that video. It is very entertaining. So, so I do suggest you go and click on this link up here. But just to briefly summarize, my first horror story was only 10 days, but it was a crazy, crazy week and a half. And so this is what I did after that. Um, the last thing you heard on my other horror story was that my host mom came and picked me up and that's where I stopped the story. My former host mom came and picked me up from the horror story house. Okay, so today I'm going to be telling you guys what happened afterwards and then how I ended up making money and being able to stay in Spain and some three huge lessons that I learned, some big takeaways that I'll tell you about at the end. Okay, well that being said, let's jump right into this video. So my other repair horror story, I broke it down day by day and this one I'm breaking it down week by week. I'm going to try to keep it pretty short, but there's a lot of really good stuff that happened in here and I'm trying to keep the content pretty relatable. So if you're in a situation like this, you might have some idea of what direction to go. So week one picks up where my former host mom came and picked me up from the other house. And essentially week one, I was just emotionally and physically exhausted. After everything I'd gone through with my other host family, once I got back to my former host family, the host family that I got along with very well, I was just really, really tired. One of the most important things about au pairing is getting into a routine. I think really any time traveling abroad, one of the most important things is getting into a routine. For essentially for 10 days, I had been constantly moving, constantly worried and uncomfortable, and it's just a very exhausting thing to do, and I was emotionally, mentally, physically exhausted. So yes, I was super, super excited to see my host kids, um, like my former host kids, my former host mom, I was so excited, but two, I was like very dull and just, generally tired, like I, I was very spent. That's a good way to describe it. My emotions were spent. If you remember this from the other horror story video, uh, the whole reason I wanted to stay in Europe was my brother was in Europe and we were planning on taking about four weeks to go and travel all around Spain. We were gonna go to Portugal, Vienna, um, a couple, like five different cities. And so I did want to stay for that because those tickets weren't refundable. But I talked a lot with my parents and with my former host mom, who at this point was my new host mom. And I decided to stay in Europe for that time being. But I knew that I couldn't just stay in Europe because I fund myself when I travel and I don't have unlimited funds. I was depending on that 70 euros a week. Even though my former host mom was letting me stay with them during this time, I still didn't have the money that I thought I would need to kind of sustain myself for this trip that was coming up. At first I thought I should start to look for another host family, but like I said, there was something that went wrong with my visa, and so I didn't have a visa. So I could only stay for three months, and really nobody wants to take on an au pair for only three months. So after about a week or so of, search, of searching for a host family in Madrid or in the surrounding area, I just decided it would be best to stay in Madrid with my former host family for about five weeks until my brother and I met up to spend a month traveling. We lived in a small village outside of Madrid, maybe like 30 kilometers outside of the city. In the village, there were not a lot of opportunities for me to do much babysitting or au pairing. I decided it would be best to try to teach English. So my host mom sent out a bunch of texts to all her little school friends and, and all the different moms in the neighborhood sent out texts. It was really, really sweet. They all kind of like banded together to help me out. And ultimately I ended up finding a bunch of new students to teach English to. So I was teaching private lessons. I think it was eight private lessons every week to like six different kids or seven different kids. I mean, I was teaching a lot and that gave me the income that I needed, but also it kind of gave me a purpose. That first week I was really, really upset. After 
leaving my former host family, I was just very uh, emotionally lost. I didn't really have any direction and just generally felt very depressed about my situation. And so having that teaching job kind of gave me something to look forward to every day. The last thing that happened in my first week, which was just crazy. So it was, um, I left my former host family on a Saturday and this was a Tuesday morning. I wake up and I see this text from my former host dad, the one who I had just left. And he was like, well, Graham, you shouldn't be lying about us to your former host family. And just a very threatening message saying that I should have come back and I should have done all these things. And so that was weird. And it just, again, it just kind of like sunk me in this like little state of self-pity that I was already in. So I did really need something to kind of lift my spirits and get me going again. I was just really, really discouraged the first week. So the next three weeks or four weeks really, week two through five, I've combined it all because it was all kind of the same. But essentially I just settled into a teaching routine. I would go to my lessons every week, which I loved. I loved, I loved, I loved. Even if you're an au pair, like working with a host family, I highly suggest you do this because it gave me a chance and it will give you a chance to connect with different people in the community, in the neighborhood, and kind of get to know some different people that you wouldn't have known originally, as well as give you extra money on the side. Also during these weeks, I started to reconnect with some old friends that I had in Covenia, in the village. And it, again, it just gave me, it kind of reminded me of why I love Spain in the first place, why I came there in the first place. So this is something else that really helped me because it kind of gave me roots back in Covenia and it reminded me why I came there. I really wish that I would have made more friends my first time. I talked about that in another video called my au pair regrets, but just a few friends that I did have in Covenia were really a lifeline and a lifesaver during this time, and I'm so thankful that they kind of showed up and <laughs> pulled me through because I was still, I mean, every day I was thinking about what had happened with my other host family. Um, it was a very uncomfortable situation and it didn't end well. And so it was always on my mind and being around my friends kind of lifted me up and lifted my spirits a bit. During this time, I also started to travel around Madrid more. So in the summer, I was constantly working. I was always with the kids and I never really traveled around Madrid that much. But during my off time now, when I wasn't teaching lessons, I would kind of travel around Madrid, see different parts of the city that I'd never been to, and also travel around the community of Madrid, which is like kind of the state. It's a really big area. And with my transit pass, I could get around the whole community of Madrid for free. So I love doing that. And that's kind of how I feel my days. So my days would be like, in the mornings, I would do my college work because I was doing college online and then maybe I would after lunch or something I would go into the city or do something like that and then I would come back for my lessons in the evening which started maybe six o'clock so it was a good routine that I got myself into and I finally settled into a routine which helped me kind of build some roots and just calm down a lot I had been feeling really bad and just anxious over what had happened in with my other host family so finally getting into a routine reminded me of why I love Spain so much in the first place and why I I came there. Week two through five is when I really started to get in the groove and love Spain again. Now I'll say this about my teaching experience. I've had people ask me about this, friends back home. So I did not teach legally, I don't guess. I just taught private lessons at people's homes. And listen, if you're an au pair looking to do this, I do not have an English degree. Um, I'm in the middle of my second year of college right now. My degree is in international relations and Spanish. I do not have an English degree. I do not have a teaching degree. So you don't have to have an English degree or a teaching degree or whatever, a literature degree to teach English. You can teach English just whatever your skill set is. And that's essentially what I was doing. Now, I did have a little bit of experience teaching. I shadowed an elementary school teacher the year prior, and so I did have a bit of experience, but overall, like, I was not a teacher. I did not train to be a teacher or a tutor, so this was definitely something new for me, and I did not have a ton of qualifications for it. But I say all that to say, if you're looking into doing something like this, you don't have to be perfect at it, okay? It's just one of those things that you can do some research on, maybe read a book, watch some YouTube, and you can do it. And I highly, highly suggest you try to teach English or whatever your native language is. The last big thing that I did during these weeks is I would take little trips around Spain. So like I said, I would go around the community of Madrid. I went to El Escorial in the very western part of the community of Madrid. Uh, Aranjuez, it's a beautiful city in the southern part of the community. And I went to Ibiza, which is an island in the Mediterranean owned by Spain. So it was a 
great experience. I'll try to put some pictures in, in the video of that, but that just kind of, <laughs> I, this sounds dramatic, but it gave me my sanity back. Like I really felt like I was going crazy after what happened and it was constantly playing on repeat in my head. Um, so. So doing that, traveling around, kind of seeing different parts of Spain, gave me my sanity back and reminded me why I love Spain so much in the first place. So if you're ever in a position like this and you do decide to stay in your host country, do travel around and see some other things outside of your city or outside of your day-to-day -day life. It will encourage you and just help you kind of get into the new routine and your new reality. Okay, so I said my brother and I spent four weeks traveling. I think in reality it was more like two and a half or three weeks, now that I'm starting to think about it. But all that to say, week six and seven um, was when I met my brother, Brady, and we started traveling. So I ended my lessons and stuff like that back in Madrid. I said goodbye to my host family. I thanked them so much for letting me stay with them. Having that opportunity to say goodbye kind of like closed a chapter in my life. While I had gone through all these really difficult things with the former host family and all this, being back with, with my original host family and just spending time with them definitely closed that chapter in my life and it just gave me some closure on everything, which I did not feel like I had beforehand. I won't talk a whole lot about these two weeks, week six and seven, because it's not really relatable content. Uh, my brother traveled, my brother and I, we traveled to Santiago de Compostela in Galicia, in Spain. We went to Porto in Portugal and then back to Madrid. But I mean, that's, that's really all I have to say about those weeks. They weren't that fancy, we just kind of traveled around. Okay, so week eight, our last week in Europe, I do want to highlight this week because it was really, really unique and I don't think many au pairs get to do this. My brother and I flew from Madrid to Vienna, a trip that we already had planned, but recall way back, right after I got kicked out of my former host family's house, I started looking for host families. And unintentionally, I accidentally found long-term host families that were gonna start in the summer or the fall of 2020. I did not mean to do this. I was looking for host families only in Spain, but I just stumbled upon some different families uh, in Europe, and I eventually found my current host family doing this, so I'm very thankful. But all that to say, I found four different host families in Vienna that wanted to interview me in person. So we flew to Vienna. We only had three days there. And in three days, I interviewed in person with four different host families. It was a crazy, crazy experience. Like, I didn't even really have that much time to visit Vienna or see the sites, but I don't regret it at all. Interviewing somebody in person, meeting these host families in person, completely changed my view of them. Getting to meet the host families in person gave me an opportunity to go to their houses and meet their kids, meet their family, and actually, like, talk face to face with them. I think this is so important because you can really tell a lot about somebody just about, you know, how they keep their house up or how they talk to their kids, that kind of thing. So for example, I was talking with one host family that was absolutely incredible in Vienna. I just loved everything about what they were saying. They sounded perfect for me. They had my exact start dates. I mean, it was just, it was perfect, absolutely perfect. And so I took a train and I went to their house one night and they were super sweet people, but immediately I walked in their house and I noticed it is so messy. Their house was so, so messy. And me, I'm a very clean person, I can't deal with that. And so I never would have known that. And honestly, I probably would have signed up to go and live with their host family had I not been in their house. And that would have been a huge issue for me. Getting to meet these people in person gave me a big feel for their family dynamic and just how they run their, how they run their houses. All that being said, I didn't actually go with any of the families I met in Austria. I ended up going with this lovely family in Seville, um, in Spain, and I cannot wait to go and be their au pair. But it was a great opportunity and I, I so wish I could do that. So I say all that to say, if you are living in Europe, or if you're already an au pair in Europe, whatever, and you're looking to meet a host family in Europe, please ask if you can fly to their city. I know it may be expensive or whatever, but it is priceless. I would 100% do this again. After this next year, I plan to either go and study Russian and Ukraine or go and live in Vienna because I did love Vienna. And so when I do this, I will fly there beforehand and meet families and stuff like this. I 100% suggest you do this if it's, if it's somewhat possible. And I promise you these host families will be thrilled to meet you in person. Every one of the host families that I met was 
over the moon and just very thankful and very appreciative that I would take time out of my day to come and meet them. So I do highly suggest this. Okay guys, so now that we've made it to the end, these are my big three takeaways from this story. Number one, have a plan B. I'm going to make a whole nother video about having a plan B and what exactly that means. Before you even sign up for a host family, think about what you're going to do if it fails, if everything goes wrong, if you're stranded. What are you going to do? I did have this plan B. I thought about it and I decided to go and live with my former host mom. But if I did not have that plan B, if I hadn't have thought through something, who knows, I may have just ended up flying home and missing out on this incredible opportunity. So please, have a plan B and think about it beforehand. The number two big takeaway that I got was ask tough questions. This one is tough, I mean it's hard, but during those interviews, ask really, really hard questions about the family dynamic, how they discipline their kids, what's important in an au pair, questions that may seem a little bit awkward to you, but please ask these questions because if I would have asked these questions in the first place, I never would have had this au pair horror story. So please ask tough questions to your host families. Number three, this is what I think is the absolute biggest one, build connections in your community. So when you go to be an au pair, don't just spend time around your peers or other au pairs or your host family. Branch out, meet other families, and build connections in the community because those connections that I made through my first au pair trip absolutely saved my life during my second trip. I really think that I would have just been depressed and gone home did I not have the friends and the good connections. My first host family, I had a great relationship with them. When I was with them, I really went out of my way to work hard and go above and beyond, and it paid off later on. They invited me to come back and live with them for free for a month and a half. They paid for my food, they paid for everything. Build those good connections, work really hard, be honest, have integrity, and I promise you it will pay off in the end, and you will make lifelong connections. So please make good connections, build good relationships. Okay guys, so that's my au pair horror story part two. I know that's very different than part one. This one is definitely more positive and has a healthy spin on it. Please take that into mind, take my three considerations into mind, and let me know what you think about all this in the comments. Thank you so much for watching this video and supporting my channel. If you haven't already, like and subscribe, and I'll see you next time. Thank you so much for watching. Bye-bye.